It seems to me that if we're going to group people like this and treat people according to their group without any reference to their behavior, that is racism, sexism, and bigotry itself. That's what we're trying to get away from, right? But this idea that there are these two groups and we must treat people based on where they are in the group is exactly what we want to avoid. This is what we're trying to get away from. We're trying to treat people as individuals, not by the group they're in. Ladies and gentlemen, how many of you were in church this morning or were somewhere else at the time? All right, how many of you are here right now? How many don't respond to surveys? Four out of 10 don't respond to surveys, Ruben. (laughs) Critical race theory. In order to cover this topic properly, I want to take us back for a minute to December 26th, 1945. It is World War II. And the Americans are fighting a battle on both fronts. They're fighting the Nazis, closing in on Berlin, and they're also fighting the Japanese, trying to make it to Tokyo. And in order to make it to Tokyo, they have to go through certain islands. This man is Hiro Onada. On December 26, 1945, he's dropped off on an island in the Philippines called Lubang Island, to the southeast of Manila. He and three other Japanese soldiers are told to go there and conduct guerrilla attacks on American and Filipino forces because they couldn't take on the Americans at that point head to head. They could only do it via guerrilla tactics. So his commanding officer says, Hero, you take these three men, go into the jungle, keep conducting the attacks, I will come back and tell you when to stop. So Hero and his men go into the jungle and they begin conducting attacks. Well, about nine months later, as you know, September 2nd, 1945, the war is over. But Hero and his men are still on the Lubang Island in the jungle, still conducting attacks. So in October of that year, the Allies begin uh, uh, dumping leaflets into the Lubang jungle saying, Hero... And your men, the war is over, come home. Hero had been trained in propaganda, and he thought this was propaganda. So then they dropped in newspapers from Japan saying the war is over. They also dropped in letters from Hero's family and his colleagues' family saying, come home, surrender, war is over. And Hero said, there is no way this war is over. Because 100 million dead was on the lips of every Japanese person. We were going to fight and never surrender. The only way we could have lost this war is if every Japanese person on the island of Japan had been killed. And I don't think that's happened. So this war is not over. In fact, to show you the kind of devotion the Japanese had to their cause, Hiro's mother gave him a dagger before he went off to war and said, if you're ever caught, kill yourself with this dagger. Now, can you imagine an American mother giving a dagger to her son saying, hey, if you're ever caught, kill yourself with this. Thanks, mom. It's a beautiful ivory handle. No, that's not going to happen in America. They were devoted to the cause. In fact, they thought the emperor was God. A divine figure. So Hero's commanding officer represented God, and so did he. He's not giving up. So he and his men stay in the jungle through the 1940s. They stay in the jungle through the 1950s. They stay in the jungle through the 1960s. It's not until 1974 when Hero's the only one left. His other three colleagues had either died or given up that a Japanese tourist from Japan goes to the Lubang Island looking for the legend known as Onada. He goes into the jungle. 
wearing black socks and sandals. Hero sees him. He's about to shoot him when he says only a true Japanese would wear black socks and sandals. This guy must really be a Japanese citizen. So he goes up to him. He says, what do you want? Suzuki says, hero, war is over. It ended 29 years ago. Come home. Hero said, I will not give up until my commanding officer tells me to give up, because that's what he told me to do. He said, keep conducting these attacks. Keep conducting the war until I come back and tell you it's over. So Suzuki goes back to Japan. He tells the Japanese government. And the Japanese government goes and finds Suzuki, I mean, Hiro's commanding officer. By this time, he's a bookseller in Japan. He said he's a businessman. They put him on a plane, a plane. They fly him to Lubang Island. He goes into the jungle and he says, Hiro, I'm your commanding officer. Stand down. War is over. So on March 7th, 1974, Hiro Onoda walks out of the Lubang Island jungle, still wearing his uniform. He's 51 years old. It's a little bit tattered. He has 500 rounds of ammunition, several grenades, a working rifle, and his ceremonial sword is polished in good shape. Two days later, he hands the sword to Ferdinand Marcos, the president of the Philippines, who pardons him for the 30 or so murders, which he didn't know were murders, over the previous 29 years he had conducted against the Filipinos in the Philippines. He would not disobey his commanding officer. He thought his commanding officer represented God. Now, here's my question, ladies and gentlemen. Who is your commanding officer? Who is it? It's Jesus. Oh, it's Jesus. I hear. I'm glad I'm hearing. It's Jesus. Well, why do I see so many Christians claiming to disagree with Jesus then? Has Jesus told you to stop being a Christian because it got difficult? Has Jesus told you that you ought not stand for truth because you might become unpopular if you do? Has Jesus said, occupy till I come, unless they unfriend you on Facebook? (laughs) No, you know why a lot of Christians are caving? First of all, I'm asking, why do Christians disagree with Jesus? I think I know why. It goes back to Pilate. You remember when Pilate had Jesus standing before the Jews who wanted to crucify him? Here's what Pilate said. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Now, Pilate's trying to be reasonable. So he asked the question, why? What crime has he committed? Did they give a rational answer? No, they just shout all the louder. Crucify him. Now, here's the key phrase. Wanting to satisfy the crowd. Wanting to satisfy the crowd. Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and then handed him over to be crucified. Wanting to satisfy the crowd. Ladies and gentlemen, are you trying to satisfy the crowd? Because if you're trying to satisfy the crowd, you're not going to be a Christian very long. Christianity is becoming increasingly unpopular, but that doesn't make it any less true. The way is narrow. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Paul said, anyone who lives a faithful life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So I say all that because, at least for me anyway, I hope my commanding officer is Jesus and I'm going to obey him, not any cultural fad or cultural philosophy. 
For those of you in the service this morning, we read from Colossians chapter 2. Don't let anyone lead you astray with some hollow or deceptive philosophy that comes from the traditions of men, not from God. So in order to talk about this difficult issue, I just want to let you know where my allegiance is. Hopefully I'll deal with it under pressure. Whenever somebody says, oh, what would you do if they put a gun to your head and said, and say, renounce Christ, what would you do? You know what my answer is? I don't know. And neither do you. Peter thought he knew, didn't he? Lord, I'll never deny you. Denies him three times before the night's up. But at least my intention, I hope your intention is, is to follow Jesus, not the latest cultural fad. So with that being said, let me point out that the race issue is a very difficult issue for anyone to discuss. Why? Because if you emphasize it too much, you become a racist. If you emphasize it too little, you're allowing racism to continue. You see, it's a very delicate issue. And we all know that our country has had a terrible history of racism. However, let me also say, it's not our country that invented slavery. Virtually every country had slavery. Yes, it is true. Whites were slaves because the northern Africans, mostly Muslims, around the time of Thomas Jefferson, took over a million white slaves to northern Africa. And many people don't recognize that. There have been slaves of all different races. And let me stay up front. There's only one race, the human race. But there have been slaves of all different ethnic groups. We could all go back in our history and say we were treated unfairly. That's true. But in this country, blacks have been treated unfairly, very much tragically, to the point of even death in our history. And we need to teach that. We need to let people know about that. In fact, most people, most people's historical perspective, unfortunately, in our culture is the first page of a Google search. Right. We don't know history very, very much. But in our country, we had what was known as Jim Crow laws. Now, Jim Crow was a character that they claimed to be a trickster. And somehow this character in the 1800s became synonymous with laws that were put into place after slavery was abolished, after the Civil War. We went to war over slavery. But then there were these laws that they called Jim Crow laws, which disadvantaged blacks. And you remember, I mean, this is, as, this is as, as late as the early 1960s. You had signs like this. Get to the back of the bus. Does anyone ever hear the name Emmett Till? For those of you that don't know, Emmett Till was a 14-year-old black boy who lived in Chicago and his mother I think had a cousin or something down in Mississippi and so she sent her son down there for a summer vacation with his cousins and uh, Emmett had allegedly bragged to his cousins that he had a white girlfriend in Chicago well this was apparently a no-no in Mississippi and at one point, he was in a grocery store, and uh, there was a married white clerk at the counter. And uh, the stories vary, but allegedly he flirted with her. And then went back to his cousin's house, didn't think anything of it. Three nights later, he was taken out of his uncle's house at gunpoint and brutally murdered. His body was found in a river with some kind of gin device around his neck and barbed wire. They beat him so badly that he was unrecognizable. Now the sheriff took Emmett's body, put it in a coffin, sealed it, and sent it to his mother in Chicago. His mother opened the casket and said, we're going to have an open casket funeral because I want them to see 
what they did to my baby. And so this picture was in Jet Magazine in 1955. And this picture, more than anything else, brought along the civil rights legislation of 1963. It wasn't an argument that won the day. It was an image that people immediately recognized. This is horrific. This needs to stop. And so they had the open funeral. In 1963, Martin Luther King, who was a Baptist preacher, as you know, went to the mall in Washington, D.C., and gave this memorable I have a dream speech in which he said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. This is biblical. This is the ideal. And the civil rights legislation was passed in 1965. I'm sorry, 1964. Tragically, Martin Luther King was gunned down in April of 1966. I think, was it 66 or 68? 66, was it 66? Is it 68? I'm getting those numbers backwards, okay. In Memphis, Tennessee. Now, with that background, I want to talk about social justice and critical theory. We're going to try and do this in three steps. First thing, what does the culture mean by social justice? Secondly, what are the fundamentals of critical theory? And we're going to talk about the positives and the negatives. And then we're going to talk about, does this line up with biblical Christianity? Now, for those of you that may know uh, our website or our YouTube channel, this is not a topic I talk about a lot. Okay, this is not my field. I'm not an expert on it. There may be questions I don't know the answer to, but I have done a fair amount of reading on it, and I have done a couple of TV, actually three TV shows on it for our TV, Jesus versus the Culture series, okay? Um, I will tell you where I'm getting a lot of this information. Before I do, these are the books I normally talk about. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, dealing from God, correct, not politically correct. They're on the book table about back there. And my goal is to try and show people why Christianity is tr true. Because if people are open to Christianity and they realize it's true, all these other problems eventually go away. And you'll see why as we go further. If you want to get a, a PowerPoint presentation of why Christianity is true, just type the word evidence, text the word evidence, I should say, to 44222. I'll put that up later. If you do decide to get a book or a DVD set, I want to point out that all the proceeds from the sale of the books and the DVDs will go to feed needy children. Mine. <laughs> Just so you know, I got three sons, so I need some help. Actually, they're a little bit older now. Uh, I was in the Navy for eight years. I grew up in Neptune, New Jersey, right down the... Down the, down the road here, that's right, that's right. And I went to the University of Rochester, went through Navy RTC, went right into the Navy after college, and uh, then went to seminary after the Navy. And my sons, I have three sons, my wife and I have three sons, and they were interested in the military coming out of high school. And they said, we want to go to college and then go in the military. What should we do, Dad? What military should we go in? And I said, well, look, if you want to fight, go Navy. <laughs> Okay, because wherever there's a problem, we just pull our aircraft carrier up and we take care of it. Okay, don't, don't need bases, none of that. We bring our own base. <laughs> the problem is Navy stands for never again volunteer yourself. Okay. <laughs> so I said, if you want to fight, go Navy. If you want a nice life, go Air Force. <laughs> so they went Air Force. <laughs> The oldest son is an intelligence officer, and his wife, who's also in the Air Force, is an intelligence officer, too, so they're brilliant together. And, uh, and they're reading your email right now, by the way. 
The second son is a KC-10 pilot. You guys know what a KC-10 is? A KC-10 is a big plane that refuels other planes in flight. Right? You've seen the planes, they're flying along, they got the boom coming out of the back. And the other planes in flight come up and get gas from them. So what we say about our middle son, Spencer, is that every day he flies up to 30,000 feet, he sits around, and he passes gas. <laughs> and he gets paid for it. This is every man's dream. If I got paid to pass gas, I'd be a multimillionaire already. The third son is not in the military, but he is out of the house. So my wife and I are now empty nesters. Any empty nesters in here? Oh, yeah. Woo! It's great, isn't it? Well, actually, it took us a while to get used to that. About 10 minutes. <laughs> That's how long it took to change the locks. All right. We love our kids, but they're messy. We've got one grandson now, too. Problem is, he lives in Oklahoma. Uh, we, live in, we live in Charlotte, North Carolina now. Anyway, I'm not going to be quoting a lot of original sources here because we don't have time. As I say, we did three hours on this and we only have, I want to keep this short so we can have Q&A. Uh, but a lot of where I'm getting this from is from this guy, Neil Shenvey, shenveyapologetics.com. And uh, he has written a lot on this issue. And if you go to his website, you can find all the original sources with regard to critical theory, and you can see if he gives it a fair shot or not, all right? I'm just going to cover the surface of this, and you can go a lot deeper by going to this website, shenviapologetics.com. All right, so what we're going to do here is start at point one. What does the culture mean by social justice? You guys ready to go? Yeah. All right. What is justice and social justice? Justice normally means individuals getting what they deserve, an impartial and fair application of the law. Right? You get what you deserve. By the way, there's a difference between justice, mercy, and grace. None of us should demand justice. Why? Not from God anyway. Why? Because then we're going to get what we deserve. And we don't, we don't want that. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And grace is getting what you don't deserve. And none of us deserve grace. It's a gift. Amen. We're all sinners, right? Anyway, this is what you think of justice. Normally when I think of justice, social justice might be something like taking action to care for the poor, orphans, widows, unborn. In fact, this was actually, this, this phrase was coined by a Catholic priest a couple of centuries ago. Social justice. Let's make sure that we're involved in the community and make sure we care for the people that need to be cared for. And the Bible talks a fair amount about this, as you know. Okay. Or it could mean oppressed groups must be liberated. Now, this, unfortunately, is what the meaning is for many people today. Not that we shouldn't liberate oppressed groups, but the idea that we're caring for the poor and the orphans, and this is sort of subsumed by this. That's why the people who really study this say, if you want to be clear, don't use the phrase social justice, because it means too many different things to too many different people. Define what you mean by it. In fact, oppressed groups must be liberated might mean that we're going to take from the haves and give to the have-nots by law. Do you realize that so much of what you hear in the media is actually sounding good even though the real meaning behind what they're promoting isn't good? If you, we talked about this this morning for those of you who were in church, for those of you who weren't in church, where were you? Uh, we talked about how Satan comes as an angel of light. That if you want to pass off something bad as good, give it a good name. Call it the Equality Act. It sounds so good. Who could be against equality? Call it choice. Who could be against choice? Everybody's for choice. Call it justice. We're all for justice. Call it fairness. Who's not for fairness? But when you really drill down as to what they're promoting, it's not just, it's not fair, it's not equality, and it's not a choice we should make. So... This is a pretty good book on this topic. 
by Scott David Allen, why social justice is not biblical justice. Here's the way he puts it. This is social justice today, secular social justice. Deconstructing traditional systems and structures deemed to be oppressive and redistributing power and resources from oppressors to their victims in the pursuit of equality of outcome. Have you heard of this? Equality normally meant equality of opportunity. For example, prior to 1964, Blacks and other minorities did not have a quality of opportunity because there were Jim Crow laws in place to keep that down. Now, at least on paper anyway, those laws were done away with in 1964. And so we had a quality of opportunity, but that did not mean a quality of outcome. In fact, the word that is now used for a quality of, of outcome is a word called equity. Have you heard this? Equity. What about equity? Equity is everybody should wind up in the same place with the same stuff, regardless of behavior. Now, ladies and gentlemen, equity has never happened in the history of the world. It's never going to happen in the future of the world. It's not even going to happen in heaven. You say, what do you mean it's not going to happen in heaven? Everyone's going to get into heaven based on grace, but you're going to get different rewards or rewards taken away from you based on negative behavior, right? You get into heaven based on grace, but you're judged in heaven based on your works. And thankfully, people like the Apostle Paul will get more works than the garden or more rewards than the garden variety Christian because it's just he should think of the parable of the talents. What does Jesus do? He, get, he talks about the parable. You know the story, right? He gives, uh, he gives uh, five to one, two to another, and one to the third. And to the five who goes out and multiplies them, he commends. To the two, same. To the one who hid it, he says, I'm going to take your talent and give it to the one that has more. That's the opposite of equity, friends. That's justice. We're going to get justice in heaven based on our works. And there are a thousand different reasons why people come to different outcomes. In fact, let me guys, let me, let me ask you guys a question in here. How many people have a brother or a sister? Okay, adult brother or sister. Let me ask you a question. Does your adult brother or sister, is he or she in the exact place you are in terms of finances, in terms of relationships? in terms of spiritual growth, in terms of health. In ter no. If you're not going to get equity of outcome from people born to the same parents under the same roof, how are you going to expect to get equity of outcome from people from different parents under different roofs? You're not. Because there are so many choices that are made. There are so many motivations that some have that others don't. There are so many other factors that go into where you wind up in life, and it has nothing to do with discrimination. Now, I'm not saying discrimination doesn't occur or hasn't occurred. I'm not saying that. The idea, however, that, that, that uh, differences of outcome are all due to discrimination is demonstrably false. And Ibram Kendi may have heard that name who's a race scholar up in Boston, said that all disparities between the ethnic groups, between the races, 100% of them are due to discrimination. That is the most illogical statement that he probably has ever made. Some might be because of discrimination, but certainly not all. Because people make different decisions. They have different talents. They have different gifts. They have different interests, different motivations, maybe different breaks in life. You're never going to get equal outcome. We're looking for equal opportunity. Equal opportunity under the law, not equal outcome by the law. Now, Let's unpack this oppressive oppressor thing for a minute. This, in my view, is the key to this kind of approach. Or this is the poison pill of critical theory. And when I say critical theory, I don't just mean critical race theory. Critical theory is, 
is a idea that includes critical race theory, but it's also critical queer theory. And there's critical uh, pedagogy theory. And there's, there's all sorts of critical theories. It's not just race theory. And what they say is the world is divided up into the oppressed and the oppressor. This comes from Marx, as you know. And here are all of the people who are oppressed, peoples of color, poor middle class, women, trans, LGB, non-Christians, disabled immigrants, and indigenous people. And this, by the way, this is from a book on critical race theory, okay, or critical theory. Now, who would be the oppressor of these people? Well, whites are oppressors, owning class are oppressors, men are oppressors of women and trans, heterosexuals are oppressors of LGB, Christians are oppressors of non-Christians. I wonder if that's true in Saudi Arabia. You think it is? No, okay. Abled are oppressors of disabled. Citizens are oppressors of immigrants. This is why people don't want to have border security. You see how all this goes together? And white settlers are the oppressors of indigenous people. It seems to me that if we're going to group people like this and treat people according to their group without any reference to their behavior, that is racism, sexism, and bigotry itself. That's what we're trying to get away from, right? Aren't we trying to get away from this? Don't we want to treat people based on the content of their character? not the group they're in? This, for me, and this we'll, we'll see here in just a minute, is called intersectionality. We'll get to it in more detail. But this idea that there are these two groups and we must treat people based on where they are in the group is exactly what we want to avoid. This is what we're trying to get away from. We're trying to treat people as individuals, not by the group they're in. So... What does the culture mean by social justice? It means that we got to take from these people and give to these people. We've got to take power. This is a power play, by the way. Take power away from anybody over here and give it to these people. That's why, in fact, some of you may have been sitting in here when I first got up and you, you probably thought, what? How, what? how can a white guy talk about critical race theory? If you, if you thought that for even a split second, you've already bought into critical race theory. Because arguments don't have race. Arguments don't have ethnicity. But this theory says that these people, since they have an oppressed experience, ought to be listened to, and they carry more gravitas with them than these people. Don't listen to these people. Only listen to these people. So, second point. What are the fundamentals of critical theory? Here are five fundamentals, critical theory fundamentals. First of all, the world is divided into oppressors and oppressed. Oppressors impose their values on oppressed groups, those groups we just saw. Number two, group identity trumps individual identity. Number three, our moral duty is to free the oppressed and the ends justify the means. Antifa. Do you see, will we use violence because the ends justify the means? Now, I know some of you are sensitive about politics in here. I get that. But you know, in a world like this, everything becomes political. Everything is a political power play. You can't avoid it. Experience trumps reason, and oppressors hide their expression or their oppression with reason. In other words, you can't use reason. You can only use stories and experience. All the people on the left we had up here, just listen to their stories. And if you try and use reason to say, okay, that may be your experience, but it's not the experience of everybody, you're going to be labeled an oppressor, and you're trying to use reason to oppress people. And I'll, I'll quote one critical theorist on this just so... You can see I'm not making this up here. The idea that objectivity is best reached only through a rational thought, only through rational thought, is specifically Western and masculine way of thinking. One that we ought to, that, that we will challenge throughout this book. 
How are they going to challenge that? By allegedly using reason, right? <laughs> right? This is a reason right here, right? Now, it's a bad reason, but they're trying to use reason. <laughs> they're saying there's no objectivity. And they're absolutely sure that their statement that there is no objectivity is, object is objectively true. You see that? This goes back to what we talked about earlier about self-defeating statements. Like when people say there's no truth, you're going to say, is that true? Right. But they're not going to use reason. Do you guys know who Thomas Sowell is? OK, Thomas Sowell is a brilliant economist. He actually was born in Gastonia, not far from Charlotte, where I live. But then when he was eight years old, I think his, both his parents died. He, he moved in with his aunt and uncle in Harlem. And he grew up in Harlem back in the 30s, 40s, and uh, learned to read and wound up being a professor at places like Cornell, Stanford, University of Chicago, UCLA. And if you go to his YouTube channel, you'll get more wisdom in watching one minute of that than watching 60 minutes of anybody else. Right? Now, here is what Thomas Sowell has said about this abuse of reason or misuse of reason, not talking about critical theory directly, but I like what he says here. Here's what he says. One of the painful signs of years of dumbed down education is how many people are unable to make a coherent argument. They vent their emotions. They can, they can vent their emotions, question other people's motives, make bold assertions, repeat slogans, anything except reason. You ever notice that? People have slogans. You're oppressing me. Social justice. You're a bigot. This isn't re these are these are just personal attacks. The fifth is the fact that individuals of multiple oppressed groups experience oppression in unique ways. This is called intersectionality. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Dennis Prager, but he has a series of videos called Prager University, and he often enlists people, prominent people, to do videos. They're five-minute videos. I want to show you a five-minute video that is hosted by Ben Shapiro talking about this concept of intersectionality. For those of you who don't know who Ben Shapiro is, Ben Shapiro is a Jewish 35 or 36-year-old brilliant conservative who recently moved from... California to Nashville with his whole organization because he just couldn't deal with the politics in California anymore. Anyway, he talks about what intersectionality is. Here it is. Check this out. It's clearly explained. You probably think your opinions matter. You probably think you're an individual with unique experiences, thoughts, and ambitions. Well, I hate to break it to you, but according to current leftist orthodoxy, you're wrong. You see, your opinion only matters relative to your identity and where that identity ranks on the hierarchy of intersectionality. If you're now thinking, what are you talking about? You haven't spent much time on a modern college campus. Intersectionality is a form of identity politics in which the value of your opinion depends on how many victim groups you belong to. At the bottom of the totem pole is the person everybody loves to hate, the straight white male. And who's at the top? Well, it's very hard to say because new groups claim victim status all the time. No one can keep track. So, how does this intersectionality thing play out? Something like this. Let's say you're a gay white woman. Your opinion matters, but less than that of a gay black woman. Why? Because while all women are oppressed by the patriarchy, and all gays are oppressed by the heterosexual majority, blacks have a victim status that whites obviously don't. Of course, a gay black woman's victim status is less than that of a black trans woman, who ranks below a black Muslim trans woman, and so on. The more memberships you can claim in oppressed groups, the more aggrieved you are and the higher you rank. Get it? Good, because it's about to get even more complicated. Intersectionality takes your victim status and uses it as the basis for creating alliances with other victim groups. 30 or 40 years ago, activists encouraged racial solidarity among blacks to combat oppression. But today, that's not enough. Today's activists demand blacks make common cause with other allegedly oppressed people, gays, lesbians, transgenders, Palestinians, Native Americans, whomever. Here's the logic. A black gay and a Hispanic gay may not belong to the same victim group racially, but they do belong to the same victim group on the basis of their sexuality. By focusing on the places where various victim identities intersect, intersectionality creates a united us versus them paradigm. Righteous victims rising up together to fight the oppressor, those dreaded straight white men. This explains why at a rally protesting the treatment of Palestinians by Israel, 
you might see a contingent of lesbian activists. That's intersectionality at work. They're so united by their victim status that it doesn't matter if Islamists throw gays off of buildings or murder female family members who defy their father's wishes. Victim solidarity trumps all other considerations. The term intersectionality was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, a professor of law at Columbia University. She explains that intersectionality was my attempt to make feminism, anti-racist activism, and anti-discrimination law do what I thought they should, highlight the multiple avenues through which racial and gender oppression were experienced. To Crenshaw, America is a terrible place full of victim groups, each with their particular set of grievances. Why shouldn't these victim groups get together and form a political coalition unified by the belief that the majority society has harmed them? That some professor tucked away in an ivory tower would come up with this nonsense is not surprising. What is surprising and disturbing is that so many people actually go along with it. America is the most open, least racist nation on the planet. That Professor Crenshaw is free to spin her nonsensical theories and get paid well for it should offer adequate proof of that. And since when do you have to live someone's experience in order to understand them? You don't have to live as a slave in order to understand that slavery is cruel and wrong. You don't have to live as a woman in order to recognize the evil of rape. Finally, and most important, intersectionality promotes the biggest hoax of all, that we aren't individuals who are to be judged on the basis of how we act, but are merely members of groups to be judged on the basis of our group identity. In other words, you and I as individuals with our unique experiences, thoughts, and ambitions count for nothing. Our racial and sexual identity count for everything. It's hard to imagine an idea less likely to produce a free and equal America than that. But what do I know? I'm just a straight white male. I'm Ben Shapiro for Prager University. There's a reason PragerU videos have hundreds of millions of views. They're informative, the people who are talking are always interesting, except for me. All the animation is fantastic. And most of all, you can send it around to all your friends and they actually know more than they did before you sent it. You should definitely consider giving some money to PragerU. So you can go to their YouTube channel and see that again. He covered that very quickly. But basically, again, what he's saying is that the more oppressed identities that you have, the more power you should have in the public square. The less of those you have, if you're over here, you shouldn't be heard or not heard very much anyway. That's really what's going on here. Now, there are problems with this. Uh, Do you guys know who Rod Dreher is? Rod Dreher recently wrote a book called uh, Live Not By Lies, where he has discovered in recent years that former Soviet dissidents who are aging in America now, who remember the Soviet Union and lived in an oppressive environment in the Soviet Union, are noticing that our culture is becoming more and more totalitarian, that people are being canceled, that you can't express certain opinions in public anymore without being shouted down or harmed. And... uh, It's a book worth reading. Anyway, here's something he notes in the book. Check this out. He says, curiously, the poor are relatively low on the hierarchy of oppression. For example, a white Pentecostal man living on disability in a trailer park is an oppressor. A black lesbian Ivy League professor is oppressed. But remember, if you try and use reason here, you're a racist. According to this theory. All right, so how does it line up with biblical Christianity? Let's look at the true aspects of critical theory, because there are many things about it that are true. For example, people are born into unequal circumstances. That's always been the case. And people wind up in different places in life for a variety of reasons. Oppression exists and it's evil. And it's existed in this country and every country. And as Christians, we ought to fight against it. Oppression is often institutionalized in laws, practices, and cultural values. That's true. Those not oppressed sometimes don't recognize oppression. I don't, my personal experience, I don't know what it's like to grow up as a black, black man. I don't. You don't know if you're black what it's like to be a white person or an Asian person. We, we don't. And sometimes you don't recognize it. I have a friend of mine who's a pastor down in Charlotte, former NFL player, and he's black. And he says, I get I get pulled over a lot by cops. 
I don't. I'm sure that happens. Sometimes it's because though they have a profile, they're looking for somebody. But I don't know what it's like. So sometimes, you know, my dad always used to say something, he used to say, which is true, he used to say, sometimes things only become important when they become personal. If you're discriminated against, somehow, then somehow you, you get, that gets your attention. If your neighbor is, you might not even notice, right? So this is true. Also, people form groups and often other those outside the group. We do this in a lot of different ways, right? You Giant fans, you're othering the Eagle fans. <laughs> Most people are evil down the, part, down the turnpike. I agree with you. We happen to win today. Notice when, you notice when your team wins, you say, we won. When your team loses, you go, they stink, they lost. You notice that? We other people all the time. Now think about phrases that have been used throughout time, but certainly in the last century. These kind of phrases, othering people, the Jews, the Muslims, the Protestants, the Catholics, the liberals, the conservatives, the gays, the vaccinated, the unvaccinated. Now, we're othering people, aren't we? And I don't care which side, I don't care where you are in here, you're looking at other people going, yeah, I ain't like you. <laughs> I'm better than you. Now, now, these groups carry certain behaviors with them, right? I'm not saying you should judge people because they're part of this group. You shouldn't because everyone is an, is an individual. But I understand why you might look at certain people in these groups and say, well, look, I don't agree with jihad. And if you're, a, if you're a, a Muslim who believes in jihad, yeah, I'm against that. Okay? So I understand that you might disagree with people, but you should still treat everybody like they're made in the image of God because they are. And you don't know why somebody's a Muslim. You don't know why somebody's a Protestant or a Catholic or a liberal or whatever. You don't know why. You don't know them. Now, here's another list of people that we other too. The rich, the poor, the blacks, the whites, the Asians, the Indians. You can't say that anymore. The Native Americans. The Irish, the Italians, the foreigners, whatever. None of these categories have anything to do with behavior. <coughs> There's no necessary behavior that the rich, the poor, the blacks, the whites, the Asians, etc. do because they are in those groups. So why would you judge anybody in these groups? Prejudge them. You might say, well, they have certain cultural tendencies. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that the person who is a white person is uh, adheres to those cultural tendencies you don't agree with or a black person or an Asian or whatever. You don't know that. You know, if somebody's a Muslim, they agree on certain things about Islam or if they're a liberal, they might agree with certain things or a conservative or gay or vaccinated or unvaccinated. You may, they may. Okay, fine. But there's no behavior associated with these. And yet we other people on them, don't we? Why do we do that? Because we're evil, that's why. We want to put people in these groups. We want to say, these are the good guys, these are the bad guys. I was down in Myrtle Beach last weekend speaking at a conference, and Bishop E.W. Jackson was there. And if you ever hear Bishop E.W. Jackson, you go, I want to hear this guy again. And right in the middle of his speech, he said this. He said, we don't have a skin problem. We have a sin problem. That's really the issue. What does your skin have to do with your behavior? Zip. Zero. Not a, you might tan better than other people, but okay. it's nothing to do with your behavior. So why are you judging people based on their behavior? 
And why are you trying to tell kids that you ought to judge people based on not their behavior, but the group they're in? Now, I don't normally go to the view (laughs) for my political opinions. I know someone in here does. (laughs) But this week on The View, Condoleezza Rice was on. You guys know who Condoleezza Rice is? Okay. Well, you already know who she is, okay? So let me just show you what she said here in talking with other people on The View about critical race theory in schools. Here you go. But if I could take a moment to talk about the whole issue of critical race theory and what is and is not being taught. Uh, I come out of an academic uh, institution, and uh, this is a, something that academics debate, what is the role of race and so forth. And, and let me be very clear. I grew up in segregated Birmingham, Alabama. Mm-hmm. Um, I couldn't go to a movie theater or to a restaurant with my parents. I went to segregated schools till we moved to Denver. Mm -hmm. My parents never thought I was going to grow up in a world without prejudice, but they also told me that's somebody else's problem, not yours. You're going to overcome it, and you are going to be anything you want to be. And that's the message that I think we ought to be sending to kids. One of the worries that I have about the way that we're, we're talking about race is that it either seems so big that somehow white people now have to feel guilty for everything that happened in the past. I I Mm -hmm. don't think that's very productive. Or black people have to feel disempowered by Mm -hmm. race. I would like black kids to be completely empowered, to know that they are beautiful in their blackness. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, I don't have to make white kids feel bad for being white. So somehow this is a conversation that has like, gone in the wrong direction. Keep that last part. You don't have to watch. Yeah. You know, there's a little bit of it in order for black kids who, quite frankly, for a long time, the way they were portrayed, the way their history was portrayed, mm-hmm. right. it was second class citizenship. Of course. But I don't have to make white children feel bad about being white How in does- order to overcome the fact that black children uh, were How does that happen? Happen? It, it I have happens. a couple examples here, actually. Yeah, yeah. In Cupertino, California, um, in an elementary school, uh, third graders are uh, instructed to rank themselves based on their power and their privilege. Uh, California's Department of Education is proposing to eliminate opportunities for accelerated math in the name of equity. In Greenwich, a white bias survey is handed out to seventh grade English class. Um, a New York private school um, is... Uh, separating by race, gender, and ethnicity, white identifying group met with a white consultant who displayed a slide that named supposed characteristics of white supremacy. Uh, An equity statement from the school district of Palm Beach County outlined the initiative dismantling structures rooted in white advantage. It's happening uh, across the country. Well, but but again, if you have a teacher, history is going to be taught. Yeah, absolutely. History is going to be be taught. taught. And as we were talking earlier, you know, when you go to Texas, you talk to Mexican kids who feel like crap because they're being told they're less than because of the Alamo. The whole idea of teaching history is so we don't repeat it. Mm-hmm. So I think that if you're a good teacher, you don't teach to make a, a, a white kid feel bad. Right. You're supposed to say, listen, you didn't do any of this, but you should know what happened. I have and, 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 and Make sure, uh, along with black kids and Native American kids and Mm -hmm. and all the colors that be in school. I have no problem with with letting people know what happened. Yes. But let's remember, history is complex. Mm-hmm. Right? It is. Human beings, human beings mm-hmm. aren't angels now, and they weren't angels in the past. No. And so how we teach about our history is also important. But you have to, there's no way to hide the fact that white people owned black people. There's no way to hide and, that. And, and, and I, I think, and I that. think that's course, been the issue, that uh, there's yeah. been this sort of rollback of history. People want to hide history. Oh, I bet. And, oh, come well, come well yes, come yes, come that, that is true. About 45 and what, seconds, and what, and what we are seeing is this, this rollback of history. Parents Parents don't want children to hear about the real history. And when we teach children about the real history, I think that is when we will really have true people are racial being, reconciliation. People are, being told, people are being taught the true history, but I just have to say one more thing. It goes back to how we teach the history. That's what I'm saying. We teach the good and we teach the bad of yes. history. Yeah, but right. what we don't do is make seven and 10-year-olds feel that they are somehow bad people 
because of the color of their skin. We've been through that. Yeah. Yes. And we don't need to do that well, again. We don't want anybody anyone. to feel that. Precisely. That's, that's the idea. That, that, that doesn't no. seem to be. That doesn't yeah. seem to be part of the plan. Oh, it no. is part of the yeah. plan. I mean, I'm you know, sorry. in Germany, I, they they teach the Holocaust to every student. Of course. I met a German and girl one time. And we teach slavery to every student. A, a, a school trip is a trip to Auschwitz or Dachau. Yes. Uh, they learn about their history, and there is not two sides to the story. We all have to learn about our history, but yes. we also have I don't to recognize. We also have to recognize that we have to live together, and we're going to do better living together if we don't make each other feel jealous. We don't have to make anybody feel bad based on their skin color. We don't have to make anybody a victim because of their skin color. That's what she's saying. Stop judging people by their skin color. That's what we tried to get away. That's what Martin Luther King was trying to get away from. Why would we go back to it? Now, biblically, what's the problem with critical race theory? There is a lot of good that we mentioned, but overall, I think overall it's rotten to the core. And I want to use the acronym BIAS. First of all, it's, it is biased because it's racism. It judges people on race rather than their behavior. That's what we're trying to, can we all agree we're trying to get away from judging people based on their race? All right. So why would we teach people to judge people by their race? Secondly, it denies our identity and unity we have in Christ. We'll see that here in just a minute. Our, our, the solution to all this is the gospel. We're all one in Christ. But critical race theory denies that. We don't have unity, we have division. I can't think of a more divisive way to try and run a country than to say, let's break everybody up into groups and pit them against one another. You know how America's going to fall? And it will fall. It's going to fall internally. When people have our hands on one another's throats, then you're going to have a major military power like China come in and be easy. The authority, it puts racist teachings over Jesus' teachings. This is the deal breaker for me. Who's our authority? Who's our commanding officer? Jesus. It's Jesus and the apostles. And then finally, it promotes unbiblical and immoral behavior. As we mentioned earlier, you get the whole package here. You get all the sexual issues that come along with this. In fact, as you may know, and of course, this again is controversial, but when Black Lives Matter, which is a true statement, but when their organization really ramped up after the awful George Floyd situation, they had on their website that they're pro-LGBTQ and they wanted to get rid of the nuclear family. You get rid of the nuclear family, you get rid of civilization. They scrubbed that from their website because they got so much criticism. But that's what Ben Shapiro was talking about that all of these victim groups come together and they want to tear down. That's another thing you need to know about critical theory. They believe, the people that really believe this, don't believe in reforming the system. They believe in tearing the whole thing down and starting over. I don't know about you, but I don't know how you get better than we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and that governments are instituted among men to secure these rights. Amen. How do you get better than the Bill of Rights? You don't. People want to tear it down. We ought to just live up to it instead of tearing it down. And we didn't live up to it. No country has lived up to their documents. But at least we recognized we weren't, and we went to war over it to fix it. We've got to get back to what Dr. King said. I have a dream. They're going to be judged not by the co color of their skin, but by the content of their character. So the ultimate solution, ladies and gentlemen, is the gospel. 
because we have unity in Christ. As you know, Paul says in Galatians, he says, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Jesus Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Meaning we're all equal. We may have different roles, different functions, but we're all one in Christ. We're not going to have an oppressor and oppressed group and say, well, you guys are the oppressors and you guys are the oppressed. We're not doing that. Now, if we see oppression, we're going to fight it. But we're not going to automatically put people in these categories. In fact, here are some questions to ask people about this. Hopefully this, this will be practical. Here's a question I ask people who are putting forth critical theory. First question is, should people be judged by the color of their skin or the content of their character? Just ask the Martin Luther King question and see what they say. How should we judge people? Next question, what laws need to change to fix racism? Because I hear people saying we have systematic racism. If there is systematic racism, let me know. If there are laws out there that are racist, let me know because I want to change them with you. And there were laws that were racist. I've seen them with my own eyes. In Charlotte, North Carolina, back in like the 1910s, 1920s, you couldn't buy a certain house in a neighborhood unless you were white. And there was such a thing as redlining. You guys know what redlining was? The banks would draw red lines around neighborhoods and say, nope, not giving any loans in these neighborhoods. Now, the response to that decades later was to say, well, minorities have been disadvantaged. So starting with Jimmy Carter in 1977, he had the community, what was the thing called? Uh, It was Community Reinvestment Act, something like that, where they wanted to, to, to make loans more accessible to minorities, which was a good goal, right? The problem was when 2008 rolled around, They gave out so many loans to people who couldn't pay them back, and then those loans got bundled and sold. And that's what caused the crash. Because you can't give loans to people that can't pay it back without then the government just printing money to fix it all again, which means it hasn't been fixed. Notice how your basic necessities keep going up. Inflation, keep printing money, that's what happens. So I always ask people, what laws need to change to fix racism? I have four suggestions I'll get to in a minute. What do you mean by that? This is a key question when people say something. People are oppressors. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by oppressor? People are bigots. What do you mean by bigotry? I've been called a bigot before because I wrote a book called Correct, Not Politically Correct, How Same-Sex Marriage Hurts Everyone. It's out there on the table. In fact, a same-sex marriage advocate called me a bigot. I said, what do you mean by bigotry? He said, fear and intolerance. I said, that's not the definition of bigotry. Those are just two more words that need, that need definition. I said, the definition of bigotry is having an opinion on something without having researched it and not being, you know, not just assuming you know the truth without having researched it. And I said, with all due respect, sir, if anyone's a bigot, it's you, because I've written an entire book on this topic, which you haven't read, and yet you're already judging me. That's what bigotry is. So always ask, what do you mean by that? Next question, how did you come to that conclusion? In other words, what evidence do you have for this position? And finally, have you ever considered fill in the blank? Have you ever considered is a way if someone says, well, you're a bigot. What do you mean by that? Fear and intolerance. Well, how did you come to that conclusion? Well, because you don't agree with me. Does that make you a bigot because you don't agree with me? Have you ever considered that bigotry doesn't mean fear and intolerance? That bigotry means that you're prejudging something without any evidence. So use these three questions for anything, by the way. We, we use these all the time when people make a statement, say, against Christianity. Like they say, for example, the, the Bible's been changed throughout the centuries. What do you mean by that? And ask them. Because they're probably thinking something different than what you're thinking. Next question, how did you come to that conclusion? 
In other words, what evidence do you have for this position? Now, if you want to customize that question or this response to the issue, they say the Bible's been changed throughout the centuries. You could say, what do you mean by that? And then how'd you come to that conclusion? Have you investigated the manuscript evidence for yourself? How many people do you think are going to say, well, yeah, just last night I was, I was up reading a book about the Byzantine line of manuscripts, right? Nobody's going to say that. You see, because most people, as Thomas Sowell said, most people don't have evidence for their worldview. They just heard a slogan. And as soon as you ask them for evidence behind the slogan that supports the slogan, they don't have any. And it's easy to ask questions. It's hard to answer them. I know I have a wife. <laughs> she asked questions. By the way, these three questions you can use for anything, like parents. If, you're, if your son calls you one night, he's got the car and he says, Dad, I'm not going to be home by 11 like you wanted me to. Don't panic. All you need to say is, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Next question, how'd you come to that conclusion? <laughs> Next question, have you ever considered if you're not home by 11, you're grounded for two weeks? <laughs> be right home, Dad. Now, husbands, 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 never, ever, ever use these questions on your wives. <laughs> if she calls you an idiot, don't say, what do you mean by that? <laughs> you know, How did you come to that conclusion? Because if I asked that of my wife, she'd have a list 36 years long. <laughs> by the way, these questions... These questions are in Greg Kokel's book, Tactics, which you all ought to read. It helps you converse with people. They're also on our app, which I'll tell you about here in a minute. All right. Ask these questions to get the conversation going. OK, now here are four things that I think we could do, because I think I don't think these laws that are in place now are deliberately racist, but I think they are laws that result in negative outcomes for minorities. Here are four. This is just my, you don't have to agree with this. You don't have to agree with anything, obviously, but. <laughs> Number one, protect life. While blacks make 12% of the population, they account for 38% of the abortions. There's not a more unjust thing we do in America than kill innocent human beings. So we need to protect human life. Black, white, Asian, doesn't matter. Native American, we need to protect life. Number two, we need school choice. Why should a minority kid who doesn't have the same school in his neighborhood that some rich white kid has not be able to go to the rich white kid's school? School choice. But of course, the unions don't want school choice. Why? Because school choice is going to create competition and competition is going to mean you got to work to keep your job, and we don't want to do that. Sorry if I'm just stepping on toes here. I know we're in a union state. <laughs> but I'm escaping tomorrow. <laughs> Number three is welfare reform. Bill Clinton had it right. He reformed welfare along with Newt Gingrich. You can only be on welfare for a certain period of time and you got to go to work. And that helped people. It helped people get out of dependency. You don't want to keep people on the dole because you're destroying them. You're making them more dependent. But uh, tragically, President Obama reversed that. And now we're paying people not to work. By the way, I don't know about you, but every place I go, I see a sign, help on it. Hiring now. Why can't we get workers anymore? Because we're paying them not to work. Yeah, that's it. Well, COVID's really exacerbated that. And then finally, housing incentive zones. We have this in Charlotte. That investors get a tax break if they invest in certain neighborhoods to give low-income people better housing. These are just four ideas, okay? I don't think, well, this Roe v. Wade law, which isn't really a law at all, came out of Planned Parenthood ultimately, and Planned Parenthood deliberately put their abortion clinics in minority neighborhoods. Because Margaret Sanger was a eugenicist. She's the founder of Planned Parenthood, 
And uh, she thought that certain ethnic groups ought to be exterminated. Sorry, just telling you the truth. So what's the bottom line to all this? This is my friend Rice Brooks. I don't know if you heard Rice Brooks. Rice is the guy that wrote the book God's Not Dead, which turned into the series and movies. He's also a pastor in Nashville. And when he started his church, he said, I don't want to pastor a just white church. So he got a co-pastor, black and white. I love their logo. Here it is. Why is the most segregated period of the week Sunday morning? Why is that? Look, if the church isn't integrated, why would society be? We should be the leaders, friends. We should be the leaders treating people as individuals, regardless of their ethnicity. And we might have to give up some of our preferences, whether it's music style or preaching style, in order to do that. We ought to come together and demonstrate that we love one another and that our skin color has nothing to do with our love. What has to, the reason we love one another is because Jesus loved us first. Yeah. And heaven, as you know, is going to be a multi-ethnic place. Yes. So church ought to be as well. Agreed? Yes. Remember, who's your commanding officer? Jesus. Let's, let's act like it. Hmm? The bottom line is this. These are contradictory worldviews. Christianity says we're sinners. We need repentance and therefore salvation. Critical theory says there's oppression. We have to engage in activism and then we're going to be liberated. This world's going to end at some point, ladies and gentlemen, even if you're successful liberating people. You still have to deal with eternity. So again, in my view, critical theory is biased. It's biased itself, it gets the wrong identity, the wrong authority, and it promotes sin. Not that everything it teaches is wrong, but we have to come together around the gospel to heal a broken nation. So if you want to go further, the books are out there, the DVDs. Here's evidence to 44222. We're on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. In fact, we have a YouTube channel that has over a thousand short videos on it. Most of them are from the college campus. That's where I spend a lot of time presenting the evidence that Christianity is true and take a lot of questions, and we'll take some questions here in a minute. By the way, we're so into YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, we've actually combined these three into one social media platform. We call it You Twit Face. <laughs> it's kind of a Jersey thing. You signed up for You Twit Face yet? We're on Instagram, too. All right. We're on radio and TV. In fact, we have a podcast every week called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. So if you uh, check out wherever you listen to podcasts, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, you can see it there. Also, download the free Cross Examined app. Two words in the app store, Cross Examine. It's got the podcast on it. It streams the TV show. It even has a quick answer section, including some of the questions I just put up on the screen. You know, what do you mean by that? How do you come to that conclusion? Have you ever considered? So you can have it right there on your phone when you're talking to somebody. So as they say something, you don't know the answer to it, you can go, hang on, I'm getting a text. <laughs> hey, what about this? It's easy, it's right there. And we're also teaching online courses. So uh, we're uh, teaching a course right now on the LGBTQ issue. Sean McDowell's doing that. There's a, a course on uh, the best pro-life course you'll ever take. It's taught by Scott Klusendorf. Uh, we're uh, teaching a class on the resurrection in January. I'll be teaching one on how to interpret your Bible. We have several instructors, so check it all out. And this is the DVD set that goes through seven hours of why Christianity is true. It's called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. I still don't have enough faith to be an atheist. So what we're going to do now is uh, do some Q&A, and uh, we're going to set up the microphone here. And since no one likes to ask the first question, we're going to move right on to the second question. <laughs> So second question. Yes, ma'am. I have ahead. a question, um, but I think I just answered it or you answered it with the what do you mean by that? But my question is, what do you say to people that try to say that the Bible endorses slavery? OK, well, that's a good question. You have you have to talk about what you mean. First of all, what you mean by slavery. OK, 
because slavery, stand by, uh, is not what you think it is. The kind of slavery that we talk about here in, um, in America is not the kind of slavery that, stand by, stand by, stand by. No, this is the wrong one. We're not killing the Canaanites here. We're going to slavery. <laughs> let's, kill the, let's kill the Canaanites another time. Okay. When you hear the word slavery, what do we immediately think about? We think about what happened in this country 160 or so years ago. That's not the kind of slavery that the Bible talks about. In fact, the word really means servant. So Old Testament slavery was not a race-based forced servitude. It was a voluntary means of working off debt or keeping captives from mustering a rebellion. So there was no welfare system or any of this. The way somebody could make sure they were taken care of, if they owed somebody money, they could put themselves in indentured servitude, and then that person would take care of that individual in exchange for labor. And it could be a short period of time, relatively speaking, or it could be their whole life. Mm -hmm. Every seven years, slaves were or servants were let go, but some servants liked the situation and they would become a bond servant for life. Also, slave trading is condemned in the Bible, both the Old Testaments and the New Testaments. It's punishable by death in the Old Testament. If we were reading our Bibles right, if we were obeying our commanding officer, the kind of slavery we had in America never would have happened. Yet in the 1950s, you actually had white preachers preaching segregation. And during, obviously, early on in our country, you had people claiming that slavery was mandated by God, mm -hmm. which is not the case because they didn't understand the difference. Also, the Bible teaches that all are made in the image of God, slave and master are equally human and protected as one in Christ. This is true in the Old Testament several times and the New Testament. In fact, we just read that passage. Mm -hmm. Galatians 3.28. Jesus came to set the captives free. And the Bible's main goal is spiritual redemption. It's not social reform, but if you reform enough people, if you redeem enough people, you'll ultimately achieve the reform you're looking for socially. So the kind of slavery in the Bible is not the kind of slavery that we had here. Mm -hmm. If we had obeyed the Bible, we wouldn't have had that here. Right. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. What's your name? Greg. I'm Greg. Greg. Go ahead, sir. Thank you for coming. Yes, and. I would like to express my appreciation of a very good and concise explanation of CRT. Of what I would like to ask you is, is CRT a form of wokeism? And more importantly, could you please help me uh, defend the faith? What should I say to a person who would come to me and tell me that God himself uh, practiced CRT when he identified a group of people, the Israelites, as his chosen race. Although at different points in history, they were oppressor when they killed the Canaanites, as you said earlier, mm -hmm. but they were also oppressed by different groups, uh, Middle Persians, Byzantines, mm -hmm. and all of those. Okay, great question. Does God oppress people is really where you're going with this, that the God of the Bible is oppressing people. No, the God of the Bible judges people because he is the supreme judge and he is the standard of right and wrong. The Canaanite situation, and we could go through it if you want, but the Canaanite situation was judgment. These people were sacrificing their children to Molech and the Israelites were doing it as well and God judged them as well. It yeah. wasn't just the Canaanites that were killed, it was Israelites that were actually putting their newborn babies on a metal idol Heat that idol was heated up, and they were watching their babies sizzle on the arms of this molten hot metal Molech god. That was judgment. And when it says God's chosen people, what that means is that God used the Jews to bring salvation to the whole world, but God's salvation is open to everyone. The Jews are chosen, but they're not favored, they're just the instrument through which God brings grace. They are. They have to come to faith just like everybody else. So if someone were to say, well, God's choosing favorites. No, God doesn't choose favorites. He chooses people to do certain things and groups of people to do certain things. But they are saved just like everybody else is saved through the blood of Christ. Thank you. What about the first question? What was the uh, first? Is it a form of wokeism? CRT? Oh, a form of wokeism. Yes. It, this is part of what people would loosely categorized as being woke, that there are oppressed groups and oppressors. 
And we have to take from these people and judge these people in order to lift these people. Now, they will say that their goal is to make it so everybody has equal power. Okay, but it's never going to work that way, as you know. And people have different levels of power based on their own personal skills. Right. You can't equalize everything. It's not going to work. People have different motivations. They have different talents. They have different desires. They have different circumstances. And so even if you tried to equalize everything, you couldn't do it. As we mentioned earlier, you, your, your brothers and sisters aren't the same as you for a reason. They're different people. Thank right? you. Thank you, Greg. Yes, sir. What's your name? Uh, my name is Odell. Odell? Yeah. How you doing? I'm doing well. Um, first, I want to say thank you for coming. Um, yes, sir. I definitely watch a lot of your information. And I get a lot from you. Oh, thanks. Um, question you uh, talked about was, how did you come to that conclusion? Mm -hmm. Basically, how did you get the evidence? How did you get the actual data? Um, how the data on what Odell what do you mean like with any with any question it could oh. be whatever but you you know you always go with that you know, that three question right that middle one is basically how you come to that conclusion yeah, how right. did you get the evidence yeah. so with any with any conversation with any argument you want to make sure what you're talking about or, or what you're trying to convey is actually factual and mm -hmm. not just you know opinion driven That's or right. whatever yeah. so with that being said with cr and uh -huh. crt uh -huh. we know that we there are both critical race theorists mm -hmm. who actually you know come up with these ideas mm -hmm. you had mentioned um even even kimdi yeah who is not a critical race theorist he claims he's not he claims he's not but he had, but he supports some of these ideas I, yeah which is which is fair yeah but um I guess my question is, and you also mentioned the guy, um, Neil, Neil Shinvey. Yeah. With, with this idea of, you know, how did you come to that conclusion? Mm -hmm. Basically meaning how did you come with the accurate data? Mm -hmm. How is it, how is it okay that you can, you know, is it okay to pull, um, data from people who are not considered critical race theorists or critical race, you know, is it okay to do that? Now, how, how, how can you defend it if it's not, you know, their, their own, their Well, I'm not as concerned as to uh, who supports what. I'm just concerned with the ideas. If they want to label themselves as non-critical race theorists, but they're still supporting intersectionality, I think this is a problem. Okay. And the people that I've spoken to think this is an integral part of critical race theory. But let's say critical race theory isn't the issue. Let's name it something else, racism, mm -hmm. okay? I don't think this kind of thing, this is both racism and sexism and all sorts of, of nationalism and all this. I don't think that ought to be taught as a way we ought to treat one another. That's all I'm saying. You know, it, it, critical race theory can be hard to get your mind around because there's no Bible. Right? There's no Bible of critical race theory. You can go, oh, here's chapter and verse. This is what it is. You've just got to take people's word for it. And you've got to look at what people are putting forth in the academic institutions, and this is the kind of stuff they're putting forth in their books, in their teachings, in their rhetoric. So I'm just judging them on, on what they're saying. I'm saying this is what they're saying, and here's why I don't think it's biblical. I guess, but with you, you know, you had started, by, and, I, and I appreciate it, you had started mm -hmm. by saying that this is not something that you are... Um, no, I'm not an expert, expert in it, on. like Neil Shenvey. Or, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. even with Neil Shenvey, is he the type of person that will say, I got this information from Kimberly Crishaw, who is a critical race Oh, theorist, yeah. Oh, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. you know, stuff like that. That's why I wanted you to go to his website, because okay. you can go all and look at all of the writings he's had, and his colleague is an expert in a PhD in this field. Right. And I totally, like, yeah. I, I believe in, in the idea that, you know, how did you come to that conclusion? Mm -hmm. Meaning that you need to make sure you have the right, right facts from the right people as opposed to, because people can say whatever. You That's know, right. But if they're not a, a, a scholar in it, then why are you really taking information from that person? He may say some stuff that may sound like it, but mm -hmm. is he a real scholar in it? That's, yeah. my, that's my whole You thing. know, I'm, I don't. Let me, I don't care what scholars believe themselves. What I care about is when they're trying to implement it in the public square, right? If they're trying to bring ideas like this into the school system and they want to teach our kids to be racist, I'm against that. Gotcha. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. So if they want to, if they want to argue at the ivory tower level, well, this is critical race theory and this isn't fine. Have that argument. But if it gets down to the street level looking like this, 
I don't think we ought to be for it. I think we ought to be against it. That's all gotcha. I'm saying. Thanks. Hello, uh, my name is Andrew. Hey, Andrew. How you doing? Hey, everyone. Okay. So my biggest question, and this is something you've covered throughout the presentation, that logic is not really something that comes up a lot with critical race theory. Mm. So no, it's it's poo pooed actually. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, and with all the lessons we learned, how to in a way, defend ourselves. I don't like to see this as a sword, more of a shield in order to better understand mm -hmm. and prepare ourselves for sin and all sorts of different arguments and conversations. How do we convince people that don't believe in logic? Yeah. Do you want me to actually explain or do you want me to? <laughs> No, Andrew, that's the hardest question because it's like trying to ask people, it's trying to, how do I motivate people who are apathetic? If I had the answer to that, number one, I'd be a billionaire. And number two, everyone would be a Christian because I'd get people interested in Christianity. But how do you motivate, how, how do you argue with people who are irrational? You don't, they're not interested in rationality. Here's a question you can ask say about this issue. If critical race theory was racist, would you support it or not? See what they say. Uh, I use this question, a variation of this question for atheists on college campuses. They get up to the microphone. If they express any hostility at all, I'll ask them, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? I've had atheists stand at that microphone in front of hundreds of people and say, no, no, wait, I thought you claimed to be rational. I thought you claimed to be reasonable. Why wouldn't you believe something if it were true? Well, it's not rational. Rational. It's not reasonable. The problem isn't in the head. The problem's in the heart. They don't want it to be true. They don't want there to be a God. Why? Because they want to be God of their own lives. You see, they're not on a truth quest. They're on a happiness quest. And they're just going to believe whatever they think is going to make them happy. And so sometimes you just need to ask people directly, if this were true, would you believe it? and see what they say. So if they don't believe in logic, just back off and ask them that question. That'll reveal whether the problem is intellectual or whether the problem is in their hearts. It's their will. In fact, let me ask you guys a question. How many people in here are Christians? Consider themselves Christians in here. Okay, good. This is a question for you now, for everyone in here. Uh, I want you to think somebody you know who's not a Christian whom you'd like to be Christian. You know, a friend, relative, somebody like that. Everybody got somebody? All right, don't point at him. Don't point at him. <laughs> All right, here's my question about the person you're thinking of right now. Is the person you're thinking of on a relentless pursuit of truth? They want to know if Christianity is true. Or are they apathetic or maybe even hostile to Christianity? How many people say the person I'm thinking of is on a relentless pursuit of truth? They want to know if Christianity is true. I have three hands out of 500 people. How many people say the person I'm thinking of is apathetic or hostile? Yeah, look around the room. You see this? Most people are looking for God like a criminal's looking for a cop. Okay? They're not interested. So what you can do is you can help them understand that their objection is not intellectual, it's volitional. They don't want it to be true. So what can you do with such a person that won't obey logic, won't obey reason? What you can do is love them and, and plant seeds every now and then. And then, because it happens to just about all of us, at some point, tragedy is going to strike that life because it happens to all of us. And then your phone is going to ring and that person is going to be on the other end. Because when something goes wrong, they're not going to call their atheist friend. What's the atheist friend going to say? Well, stuff just happens. There's no rhyme or reason. You become worm food and you die. That's it. You know, you die, become worm food. It's over. They're going to call someone a spiritual death because when the student's ready, the teacher will appear. They'll call you. So that's all you can do is love them and plant seeds and wait. Make sense? Yes, it does. Right. Uh, thank you for coming. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. So... I was sitting and I was listening to you and I was listening to both sides, right? And I can understand both sides. 
I can understand critical race theory as critical race theory is, and then I can understand it as being biased and racist. Mm -hmm. And then I can see how one side has a lot of works. It has plans, it has actions, all these kinds of steps, even in its faultiness. Mm -hmm. And I can see as a Christian how to take both and do something with it. But that's me. Mm -hmm. So how is it that we teach each other as Christians how to do something about this in a sense of like, we're planting seeds, but we're not teaching each other how to farm these seeds. It's like, yes, we can pray about this. And yes, we can, you know, minister to people and do certain things. But sometimes faith requires action. Mm -hmm. And it's how do we take action against oppression and against division and really work with unity when we're not even technically unified mm -hmm. as like a church. Mm -hmm. So it's, I want to know how, like, what's your thoughts on how Christians can live, be of a help in this situation? Well, for example, on the abortion issue, there are Catholics and Protestants working together and have been working together to try and reduce abortions through crisis pregnancy center, to, through counseling, through working to change the law, to helping expectant mothers, right? These are ways that Christians can come together and do that. There are Christians that help the poor. There are Christians that help in, in housing situations. There are foster parents, right? There are uh, parents that adopt. I mean, there's many ways we can help, uh, not just political ways, the ways that I mentioned. So we, we, we do have to be involved and the church, as you know, is designed to do ministry. The pastor is not supposed to do all the ministry. According to Ephesians 4, the pastor and his team are supposed to equip the saints to do ministry. So if you have a passion for something, God raises people up to do certain things. You can lead a group of people to go make a difference. So the question is, on this issue, how can you make a difference? How can you... See, it's, it's it, as I said earlier, race is a hard issue. It's a hard issue. Why? Because if you emphasize it too much, you become a racist. If you don't emphasize it at all, you may allow racism to, to, to fester in advance, right? So how do you find that balance in there where you don't, where everything isn't about race, but it's enough to say, hey, let's treat everybody as individuals. But what you said, doesn't that tie into a little bit of the pilot analogy? The pilot analogy, what about it? That you're wanting to satisfy the crowd? Yes. What? Because if we're all people, right? Mm -hmm. We're all God's people. Mm -hmm. Why is race so difficult to talk about? Why is it so hard to create I, works in that aspect when you just kind of, it's like these people are suffering. People are suffering. Mm -hmm. How do we aid people in their suffering? We could think about it like people are dying without salvation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are we doing about this? Whatever mm -hmm. way it is to present it to the masses mm -hmm. so they understand it, mm -hmm. it's kind of not being done. It's being avoided. Mm -hmm. So how do we teach? Well, that's why I ask people who want to fight racism specifically, first of all, from the, a law perspective, what, needs, what laws need to change? That's what I want to know. I gave four things that I think should change, yes. okay? From a, from a law perspective. What can we do in the church, regardless of what happens politically? And one of the things I think we need to do is be more integrated on Sunday morning. So that may mean that I have to do away with some of my preferences when it comes to worship or preaching style, so I can be with my black brothers and sisters, and vice versa, right? If we're going to come together as a group. And there are people that make a concerted effort to do this, like my friend Derwin Gray in Charlotte, you know, Transformation Church. He's trying to create a multi-ethnic yes. church. And it's, 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 it's hard, right? Because, again, if you emphasize it too much, then race becomes everything. Emphasize it too little, then you might just have a segregated congregation. So it's a hard, it's not easy, it's not an easy problem. But this is not the solution. That's all I'm saying. To put people in boxes and say, we're going to judge you based on the box you're in, that's not the solution. That's racism itself. But can we cancel a solution without having a replacement for it? Yeah, you can say, don't do that bad thing. I don't have a good thing for you to do right now, but don't do that bad thing. Your, your parents tell you that all the time, don't they? <laughs> yeah. They really do. 
Thank you. All right. Thank you. I like the way your mind works. <laughs> but my question I came up to ask you is about is we found out because of the all the classes that were online, some of the things that were going on in schools, and I think this is how we found out about the critical race theory being in the schools. So as concerned parents and grandparents, some of us want to start going to the school board meetings and speaking up about this. But first, we have to learn about it, it seems like, and, and then to speak wisely and clearly about it, that's what I want to ask you some guidance for. Yes, I think some of asking some of the questions can really highlight where, say, school board members are coming from, and that's why I wanted to offer these questions. These questions to ask, as we mentioned earlier, this is a key question. Should people be judged by the color of their skin or the content of their character? And what laws need to change to fix racism? What policies are you putting in place in this school to fix racism? What are they? I want to know. I, I did find out another thing because I've been doing a little bit of research that a lot of the CRT is buried in a lot of LGBTQ uh, Exactly. You get the education. whole package. That's part of the problem. And it's being introduced in New Jersey in kindergarten based mm -hmm. on laws that our governor pushed through and, you know, explicit sexual activity in up to middle, middle school ages. And it's the... Um, it's bad. It's just bad in New Jersey, and I'm trying to respond to it. Well, here's, let me give you some hope, because I think a lot of people are weary of fighting. Your job is not to win. Your job is to be faithful. So you just do what's right and leave the results to God. Amen. That's all you do. Right. Yes, sir, what's your name? Brendan. Hey, Brendan. Go ahead, sir. Um, hi, I'm from Long Island. Long and Island. So thanks I'm for from coming out. New York, no problem. I love um, Cross Examine YouTube oh, channel. Thanks, Phenomenal. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to ask you, uh, Dr. Uh, Frank, that as CRT, social justice, progressive Christians, and cultural relativism um, invade the church world, what is your advice for the next generation on defending the church? Defending the church or defending the faith? What do you mean? Um, like, for example, in New York, our mm -hmm. governor, um, Governor Hochul, went to a church and at the podium, she kind of said something really heretical, like um, to take the vaccine to be her apostles. I saw that. And that's kind of, there seems to be um, not a separation of church and state. Like whenever the church wants to get involved, there's always government pushback, mm -hmm. but it's not um, evenly reciprocated True. on the Tom, church side. Thomas Jefferson, when he wrote the phrase separation of church and state in a letter to the Danbury Baptists, wanted a one way wall of separation where the church would influence the state, but the state wouldn't interfere with the church. And separation of church and state is not in the First Amendment. In fact, Thomas Jefferson had nothing to do with writing the First Amendment. That was James Madison. Thomas Jefferson was the ambassador to France when the Bill of Rights was ratified. It was the Supreme Court who took that letter from Jefferson and imported it into the Everson versus Board of Education decision in 1947. And from that point on, people seem to think that in our Constitution, there's a separation of church and state. There is no separation of church and state by the Constitution, but we don't have church and state united because we want freedom of religion. The church can certainly influence the state. And when we say the church, we mean the group of people called believers. But the state is not supposed to interfere with the church. And that's what the state has done for the past two years, mm -hmm. ever since COVID began. They're keeping abortion clinics and liquor stores open, but somehow the church is not essential. So I'll just tell you, I don't know how, how you guys could deal with it here, but my friend Jack Hibbs out in California, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, had a very big church of about 7,000 or so. And when COVID first hit, like everybody, we, we don't know what this is. Okay, we'll, we'll stand down for a little while. Ten days to flatten the curve, right? Okay, it's now two years. Anyway, and he finally decided after two months he was going to open. He felt God was prompting him to open, so he opened. And Governor Newsom out there kept sending him letters. You need to close. You need to close. And he just kept going. Right now, his church has doubled 
And there are people driving three hours on Sunday to go to church because their local churches aren't open. If there's anything essential, it's church. Now, you can take precautions. You can wear masks, social distancing and all that, but we ought to come together and and support one another. I mean, it's not Ebola. OK, I can understand if it was Ebola. OK, yeah, but it's not Ebola. So um, I think that we have to ensure that we continue to be the church. And if the state tells us we can't do something either God told us to do or forces us to try and do something that God says we ought not do, then we civilly disobey. We take the punishment. Make sense? Yep. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Oh, yeah. So I'm um, currently um, intern with Rosho Christi at Rutgers. Oh, beautiful. Um, yeah. All right. So, yeah. Thank you for, you know, coming to our meeting, and our, our, our virtual and uh, for this as well. Actually, tomorrow we were supposed to be at Rutgers, but <laughs> yeah. COVID has kind of shut that down because it's so dangerous, especially, <laughs> especially, to, especially to kids. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I just want to mention we also have a row of um, people. Uh, from Russia, we have Boss and Stephen, our chapter oh, directors. Where are they? So, yeah. all right. Hey, Boss and Stephen. Thanks. Hopefully, we'll get out there next semester. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, if I could just give a little bit of context, I guess, for my question, mm -hmm. trying to synthesize two things into one to save time. Um, so, basically, I think there's a church um, that uses our building um, after our service, and they're, uh, I guess, I don't know what the term is, but in, I don't know, ethnic church. I don't want to like use that term, but like basically I think they have like Korean in their name of yeah. the church. And mm -hmm. so I'm wondering if sometimes we can have um, unintended othering um, mm. where, you know, in people in my, in my church, they kind of just refer to them as the Koreans. And then like, you know, that doesn't necessarily imply that a bad connotation or anything, but maybe you can have an unintended othering effect and then maybe, um, for instance, like if a church had Korean in it, in their name, and I, if I, I wasn't Korean, I wouldn't maybe, you know, go seek out and try to attend just because I'm not Korean. And mm -hmm. So I guess um, I've been hearing also the term like unconscious bias thrown around with critical race theory. Mm. So I guess what is your evaluation of that term? And um, if that refers to unintended consequences of you know, like having Korean in your church or like an ethnic name in your church name or referring to a group of people as the blank, um, how do we prevent against that as Christians? Well, when people say that others have unconscious bias, I'm going to ask them, what do you mean by that? Right. <laughs> and how did you come to that conclusion? And is your opinion that people have unconscious bias your own bias? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe you're right. Maybe people do have unconscious bias. But if it's unconscious, why are you blaming them for it? <laughs> yeah. I'm... How do they know? They don't. Maybe you can awaken them to it. Like I said earlier, there. I, I, my experience is my experience. I can't live somebody else's experiences and vice versa. So we may we may all have blind spots. We get that. But what does that have to do with this? Should, oh, not this. The, the thing I had up there before. The two <laughs> the two columns, right? Now, look for a Korean church. You understand why they're a Korean church because they're in America and they're probably speaking Korean in the service. And they want people who are from Korea to come to their church so they can experience the mass or the service in their own language. So I understand why they do that. And I would assume, although I haven't been to Korea in about 15 years, I would assume that Korea is pretty homogeneous, made of Koreans. I'm sure there are foreigners there, but it's not like the United States was a melting pot, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you might understand why they say, well, we're, we're from Korea. Let's all get together on Sunday and speak uh, Korean and have, have a church service. I, I, don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, now, personally, I wouldn't go because I wouldn't know what's going on. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. So I don't, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering because I know you mentioned um, how like we both ha like everybody has to make some sort of sacrifices. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if that would qualify. Maybe. I mean, I know. So a lot of churches, they, they, they have like an, a service in English or they might do away with Korean or for maybe us to not recognize, to, you know, to not let a name of a church hinder us from attending. So like, would those be like sacrifices that, you know, contribute? Yeah, to but obviously the language barrier is huge. Yeah. So if you can't understand one another, why are you sitting in there? Right. You might right. not be able to do much. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I you know, I just, yeah. I guess looking 
I don't know. I think maybe, yeah, I, I understand how tough it is, I yeah. guess. But uh, I think, yeah, the goal is to strive for unity. And Christ, right. So. Well, here's what's going to happen as the culture continues to close in around us. First of all, the true Christians are going to actually uh, come together, even across denominations, because the secondary and tertiary issues we argue over are going to seem like nothing compared to the persecution that comes. So that's going to bring a certain unity. And the people who aren't really Christians are just going to float away. Right. They're just going to they're going to leave because they don't want to deal with the persecution. So there is there are good things that come out of persecution. We don't wish it on ourselves, but good things can come out of it. We can grow. We can get more unified. We can major in the majors and not the minors. And we can we can become more like Jesus because Jesus actually learned obedience through suffering. If Jesus learns obedience through suffering and he was sinless, what about us? Yeah. Yeah. Just sucks sometimes that has to be that way. But. Yeah, I know. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. I'll be at the uh, table. And uh, the great Reuben here is going to close us out, ladies and gentlemen. So.